It's the first time I've been introduced lovely. <laughs> but I do have a little bit of hair, so. Well, good morning, everyone. I do. Except when I look like this, then everybody can see. I'm working on it, Pastor Weaver. Well, good morning, everyone. How many of you feel just a little bit weird because it's cold and snowy outside? I mean, you just don't understand it, but it's just kind of like, I don't know, it's the change of seasons, and uh, who, who was expecting this? But, you know, there are places not far from here that got several inches of snow, like, and some places not too far that had feet of snow. Black Hills, I heard this morning, Corey Hansen told me, 23 inches of snow in Spearfish, South Dakota, where he's from, so... Yeah, it could be worse. It could be worse. Thankful we live in Iowa. Well, we uh, begin a new series today, and uh, it's entitled, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And uh, you might have heard a movie by that name. It came out in 1947. Uh, It's a Christmas movie. How many of you have seen that old classic, It's a Wonderful Life? Raise your hand, keep it high, all right? Put your hands down. If you haven't seen the movie, raise your hand. Look at this. There is a few people who have not seen It's a Wonderful Life. I was going to bring a clip for you today. Actually, I had it in there, but we were having such issues with the computer that I just decided it's not not even worth it. But I think that maybe some of the computer issues have been resolved. So uh, computers, love them, hate them, got to live with them, though, because that's the world where we're at right now. Um, But for those that maybe haven't seen the movie, uh, it's, it's about a man named George Bailey. And uh, he, uh, because of a lot of frustrations and some perceived failures in his life, um, he gets to a point in life where he wishes that he hadn't even been born. And he meets this guy named Clarence, who we find out is his guardian angel, and uh, Clarence uh, comes to him, and basically in this conversation, Clarence says to him, you've got your wish, your wish that you, you had never been born. And so he takes George Bailey back through his life and they kind of see, you know, people that he should know that don't know him because really he's seeing life as if he had never been born. And really comes to a place of, of understanding and realizing that while life had been tough and while he had fallen on some hard times and, you know, he had all these hopes and dreams uh, from the beginning of his life. I mean, we saw that he was planning to travel the world and just thing after thing happened and his, his uh, dreams had been crushed. Uh, but he had a family and he had a, he had a job and was running the, the bank in town, the savings and loan, and, and, uh, but things got difficult. And so through being able to see that, how that impact, the impact that he did have on his life, Matt, was that me? Is it better? Okay, good. He was able to see that through his life, he really had impacted and made a difference in the world. It got to a point where he realized, I, I really want to live. And I think this wonderful life that we've been given, at Christmas, we say it's the most wonderful time of the year. And the life that we have been given is really, truly a wonderful life. But how many of you know that life can come with some bumps and some difficulties? We face some things in life from time to time, and Christmas can be a difficult time of the year. But God has given us principles to help us uh, through times of sorrow, difficulty, and trouble. And so over the next few weeks, we're going to be addressing some of these some of these common struggles that people have that they experience in life, and especially that kind of tend to um, come about, or we realize it through the holiday season. And we're going to see how the incarnation, the birth of Jesus, changes everything for us. You see, because Jesus came, we truly are set free from fear. We're set free from anxiety and worry, guilt and shame, loneliness, depression, disappointments, and some unmet expectations in our life. Jesus Christ and his life makes all the difference. John chapter 1 verse 1 says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 9 says the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. John 1 14, 
says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The message version says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. You see, the word and the light are Jesus Christ. And I want to ask this question, maybe what would have happened had Jesus not been born? George Bailey got to see what life was like if he hadn't been born, but what if Jesus hadn't been born? What if he hadn't come into the world? If Jesus hadn't come into the world, there would be no angel telling Mary, you have found favor with God and you will give birth to the Messiah. There would be no uh, John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus' ministry here on earth. There would be no disciples. There would be no early church. There would be no miracles. There would be um, no, no fulfillment of the law through Jesus Christ. No salvation available by grace through faith if Jesus hadn't come. But the reality is, is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish but have eternal life. So Jesus has come, and this morning uh, we're looking at this wonderful life that Jesus came to save mankind and restore life to us. This morning we start with the topic of fear, and maybe you're thinking, what does fear have to do with Christmas? But when you read the Christmas account in Scripture, there are many times that an angel of the Lord appears and tells various people, don't be afraid or fear not. There's a whole lot of fear not going on with the Christmas story. And I realized just in some research this week that there are a lot of fears that surround Christmas. There's even an official name for the fear of Christmas trees. Can you can you pronounce that? I'm gonna try. Christogenial Tico Dentrophobia. Now, dentrophobia is the fear of trees, but this is the fear of of Christmas trees. Anybody here that would admit that you're you're afraid of Christmas trees? Somebody somewhere in the world is because we have a name for it and I don't know how we ever came up with a name, but having a fear of Christmas trees kind of raises a few questions in my mind and, and maybe think along with me with this. Since all live Christmas trees happen to be uh, pine trees, is a person with this Christmas tree phobia, are they afraid of pine trees all year round? Or is it just at Christmas time? Uh, could a person with this fear uh, be afraid that because, because of the bugs that can come in on the trees? Is that why they're afraid of them? And I, yes, I was reminded of the Christmas vacation. You remember when they bring the big tree that, and the squirrel? Yeah. Maybe that's why someone would have a fear of Christmas trees. I, 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 I wonder. Or could it be the possibility of, a, of the tree catching fire that scares the person? Do artificial Christmas trees bring panic and fear to, this, to these people? And does the tree have to be decorated for the person to be afraid of it? That's the real question. I, it just makes me wonder. There are a lot of fears surrounding Christmas. You know that there is a fear of elves? Phaophobia, the fear of elves. Cisanophobia, the fear of kissing under the mistletoe. Gabophobia, which is the fear of presents or gifts. I don't think there's anyone in here that is afraid or fearful of, of gifts. But it just asks this question because fear is a real thing, and fear is definitely something that um, we all, in some way, shape, or form, are affected by. And just ask the question today what are, what are you afraid of? What are your fears? Gallup uh, poll asked this question, what scares most Americans? And and here's a list of things that scare people in America. Number one, being snakes. How many of you share a fear of snakes? Yes. I I usually when I'm in in the yard and I find a snake, I'm behind a lawnmower and I have to admit that I have taken out a a snake or two. (laughs) You know that feeling when you're pushing a lawnmower in your yard and all of a sudden out pops one just right ahead of you and just like startles you. I broke out in uh, goosebumps and I'm like chasing it down with a lawnmower. <laughs> Anybody with me? Been there? Okay. Why do snakes uh, cause us fear? Public speaking? Uh, that's one that affects me. And um, so I identify with snakes and a couple other things on here, but probably one of my biggest fears growing up is the fear of drowning. 
Maybe because I had an experience as a child where I nearly drowned. And uh, so, I mean, we have, we have these fears. So swimming is not my favorite thing. Dogs are on the list. I can't imagine people being afraid of our little mulchy mocha that's about this big. But, you know, some people have fear, fear of dogs. We all are affected. And my fears might be different from your fears. But uh, here's another list for you. Ten of the strongest human fears. Fears shared by people everywhere. And I would say that probably if the things that were on the former list don't affect you, some of these probably do. The fear of failure, fear of death, rejection, ridicule. Some of these things go together like death and the unknown, rejection and ridicule, pain and misery, failure and loneliness. Our lives can be affected by some of these basic human emotions. Our list may not be the same, but we all are affected by fear in some way. We're told in the Bible so many times, probably over a hundred times these words are recorded depending on which version that you read, fear not or don't be afraid. So many times the scripture tells us not to be afraid. And so this morning we're gonna look at the Christmas story and if you have Bibles or you wanna look on your own device, I think we've got the scriptures Uh, on the screen for you, but I would encourage you, even though we project these, it's a good thing to bring your Bible. It's a good thing to use your Bible. Uh, Whether you've got an electric version or you've got it in the old style book form, uh, it is a good thing to read from your own Bible. And so we're gonna be looking at the Christmas story in the book of Matthew chapter one and Luke chapter one and two. And we're gonna be looking at three different times in the Christmas story where an angel Uh, comes with these words, fear not or don't be afraid. The first person that we're going to look at this morning is is Mary. So we're looking in Luke chapter 1, if you want to turn there. And with Mary, we're asking this question, uh, am I afraid of what God is asking me to do? What is God asking me to do? Some people say that fear is the opposite of faith or that fear is the absence of faith. But I tend to think that fear is faith. It's just faith in the wrong things. See, what we tend to do is we go to this fear of the what if. How many of you are what if kind of people? You're faced with a circumstance or a situation and your mind starts tracking what if this, what if that. What what if, what if I lose my job? What if I get cancer? What if the economy falls apart? What if? Our mind, there is an endless amount of what ifs. And fear is simply placing our faith in a worst case scenario. Faith, where is our faith? Second Timothy 1, 7 says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So where is our faith? God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. So why are we so afraid when it comes to God's plans? Or are we afraid of what God is asking us to do? Why are we afraid of that? I think one, because God's interruptions are often inconvenient. God interrupts our lives, and sometimes things don't work out quite like we thought that they would. Actually, most of the time, it doesn't work out quite like we thought we would. Let's pick up the story of Mary, Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, that is uh, John the Baptist's mom, she became pregnant after years of trying to conceive a child. And way beyond the years of being able to uh, give birth to a child, Elizabeth uh, and Zechariah, her husband, uh, become pregnant and she eventually gives birth to John the Baptist. But it says in her sixth month of her pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. If an angel shows up to you and says, greetings, the Lord is with you, how many of you would be afraid? How many of you just think, yes, an angel. This is going to make my day. 
I don't know what Mary thought of this first encounter here, but, sh- but the angel said, Mary, you are favored of all women, and the Lord is with you. And it says that she confused and disturbed. Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. What does this mean? What do you mean I'm highly favored? What do you mean the Lord is with me? What comes next? What are you talking about? You see, Mary's engaged to be married. She's engaged to be married to Joseph. And uh, she was at the stage where she was doing all the things that engaged people do. You know, everything was just as she thought it should be. You know, I'm sure she was searching Pinterest to find, you know, like how she was going to fix her home or, or um, just some different ideas of what they were going to do with the, with the wedding, you know, planning, all these kind of things. And then this angel shows up, interrupts her plans, and everything uh, from that point becomes incredibly inconvenient for Mary. Could it be that what we call interruptions in life are actually God's invitation? God interrupted Moses' life with a burning bush. God interrupted Saul's uh, life with a, with a bright light on the road to Damascus. God interrupted Jonah with a big fish. See, their lives have been completely interrupted, but completely changed by God forever. Could it be that what we call interruptions are actually God's invitation? The second thing that I want us to see with this is that God's purpose is often different than our plans. How many of us have figured that out? God's purpose is often different than our plans. Continue reading in the story, Luke chapter 1, verse 30. The angel said to Mary, don't be afraid. There it is. Fear not, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be, he will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. That's good news. Except Mary's going, wait a minute, time out. How can this be? You're telling me I'm pregnant, but I'm still a virgin. I've not been with a man. Yeah, that seems like an issue, doesn't it? You're telling me I'm pregnant, how could this be? It doesn't make any sense. I don't understand what you're talking about. Not only does this sound impossible, it's like completely absurd that I would be pregnant even though I'm still a virgin. How does this work? Maybe you're asking some questions today too where you say, you know what, I don't understand. These things that are happening in my life, they don't really make a lot of sense. How is this gonna work? How am I gonna pay my bills? Will our marriage make it? Will I be healed? How are we gonna survive this storm? Mary asks this question, how, how can this happen? And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say that she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Some of your versions say, for nothing is impossible with God. I know you're saying, how can this work? I know you're saying, This doesn't make any sense. I know you're saying this just doesn't compute. But how many of you have figured out that truly nothing is impossible for God? Have you ever been in circumstances or situations where you thought, I don't see any way how this is going to work? But you're here today to say it worked because nothing is impossible with God. So when we think about this question of what, is God, what God has asked me to do and being afraid of what he's asking us to do, here's the thing. God is for us. God is with us. God is, has plans for our life. And he says, I know the plans I have for you. It's plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in the future. So when God asks us to do something, guess what? He can make good on his promise. But we often are afraid of what God is asking us to do. Second situation that we're going to look at has to do with Joseph. You can turn to Matthew chapter 1. And with Joseph, we're going, to, we're going to wonder what this fear of what people think about me. 
we all to some, de- to some degree care what people think about us. The kind of clothes that we wear, the kind of car that we drive, the people that we hang out with, we care about what people think. Matthew chapter one, verse 18, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you just to stop, and I know we've asked this question before, but imagine what Joseph is thinking at this point. To hear the news that Mary is pregnant. They're engaged, they're not completely married, they're in this betrothal uh, period, which is about a year before the actual marriage becomes final, and Mary would move out of her parents' home and move in with Joseph. So they're still in this period where there should still be, uh, there there should be no uh, sexual interaction at all. And she shows up pregnant, and she tells, she, I mean, what what does she tell Joseph? Joseph, I've got good news. Is that good news? She's highly favored. She's gonna give birth to the Son of God, and he's gonna save people from their sins. But Joseph is looking at this going, okay, I know how all this works, and this doesn't add up, this doesn't compute. You're wanting me to be excited for the fact that you're pregnant and we've never had sexual relations with each other. Who, who's the other guy? I mean, in our natural mind, right? Who, who, think, who just says, oh, sure. Yeah, you're, you're a virgin and you're with child. That makes a lot of sense. I see how that works. No, I don't see how that works. That doesn't make sense. And, and so what does he do? He starts going to this thought. I'm, I'm just trying to imagine what he does at this point. He's thinking, what, what are people gonna think of me? What are people gonna think of her? What am I gonna do with this? I'm gonna be dealing with this for the rest of my life. And so he comes to the point of deciding that he's gonna be done with the relationship, that he's gonna move on and start over. He's not gonna make it a public thing because you know, really if he made it public, she could be stoned to death. So he decides in verse 19 that he's just gonna divorce her quietly. It says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man, and he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement and divorce her quietly. And so Joseph is about to learn one of life's most important uh, lessons, and that is that God often Um, pleasing God often means disappointing other people. We've got to ask ourselves a question, who do we want to please? Are we about pleasing God or are we about pleasing people? Are we a God pleaser? Are we a man pleaser? Verse 20 says, after he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, what did he say? Do not be afraid, here we hear it, to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will soon have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So we've got a choice. Are we gonna please God and do what he says, or please people and what they they expect us to do? Are we gonna do what we know that God is asking us to do, or are we gonna go with our own gut and say, "This this is what makes the most sense to me? Becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. Let me repeat that. Becoming obsessed with what people think about you. Are we concerned about what people think? It goes to the kind of things that we buy, the kind of activities that we do, the the home that we live in, all the different things that we do because of what other people think. Being obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. Or think of it the other way, becoming obsessed about what God thinks about you is the quickest way to forget what people think about you. So who do we care and what they think about us? Are we a God pleaser or are we pleasing men? We're living for God, we're not living for people. Imagine the kind of pain and grief that Mary and Joseph endured. I mean, he decides he's gonna take Mary as his wife. Now, I mean, they're, they're gonna try to explain this all the ways that, you know, doesn't really make sense to them either. How did this happen? You know, it's the Holy Spirit. Honestly, we, we, we've not been together. I mean, 
There's shame and there's all kinds of different things that go along with this. They're going to be rejected by their friends. They're going to be ridiculed. Uh, They're going to be gossiped about. But more than the opinions of people, Joseph cared about the opinion of God. We don't have to understand completely to be able to obey immediately. If we wait till we have it figured out, it may not ever happen. Here's the deal. The outcome is God's responsibility. Obedience is ours. Does that make sense? Outcome is God's responsibility. Our responsibility is just obeying. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. A third situation where an angel comes with the news, uh, do not fear. Luke chapter 2, with the shepherds. And with the shepherds, we're going to address this fear about where we stand with God. Something that you ever think about? Where, where do I stand with God? How do I compare to other people? Am I good enough? Luke chapter 2, verse 8, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. Angel shows up, and people seem to be terrified. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will, result, that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem in the city of David. It's good news, it's great joy, and it's for all people. Stop for a minute and think. The first announcement of the birth of the Messiah was to who? Shepherds. It wasn't to the priests or the scribes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day. It was to shepherds who were in the low part of the totem pole of society. They were kind of outcasts. They were uneducated. A shepherd, a a religious person wouldn't even dare touch a shepherd because a shepherd was unclean. A shepherd uh, couldn't keep the Sabbath because their job uh, was a 24-hour day, seven days a week. It's kind of like an over-the-road trucker. I mean, they're gone and they're just gone, driving all the time. A, a shepherd was on duty. I mean, it's not like he can just like check out for two or three hours and say, "I'm going to go to I'm going to go to temple," and uh, you know, the, somebody's got to watch the sheep. So so often their job kept them from being able to 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 go to uh, to celebrate the Sabbath. You see, parents didn't want their daughters marrying a shepherd. No parent would want that. Uneducated. Dirty people. Shepherds weren't even allowed to testify in court. I'm sure most of the shepherds felt unworthy, inadequate, unloved. They were just kind of an outcast of the culture, afraid of where they stood with God. But God chose to come to them to make this announcement. Isn't that amazing? How many times in Scripture do we see that God chose, chooses uh, the lowly things of this world? Or he chooses people who really don't have much stature, but he chooses them to do significant and great things. It was the shepherds that he brought this announcement to. So while they felt unworthy, inadequate, and unloved because of their circumstances, I'm sure that there's a lot of people today sitting here who felt the same way, maybe feeling that way today. You feel unworthy, inadequate, unloved. You know what you've done. Feel like you're not as smart as the next person or as popular or as attractive. And you're thinking, I don't, I don't like myself. And if other people seem to not like me, how could, how could God love me? And how could God accept me? Here's what the angel said to the shepherds. Don't be afraid. Fear not. I bring you good news. This good news is, brings great joy to all people. It's to you And to everyone else, the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem in the city of David. A Savior has been born. This is good news. Don't be afraid. Good news. 
Here's the good news, Romans chapter three, verse 20. No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true of everyone who believes, no matter who we are. You see, you can't earn God's acceptance and his love, you can never be good enough. So you may you maybe put yourself through those paces of feeling like I'm inadequate, I'm not good enough. God, I, you, you've gotta be, I've heard people say, God's gotta be mad at me, upset with me. Here's, the, here's what I can tell you for sure. God is deeply in love with you. So much so that he came to earth right here with a purpose, not of living here, but, but of growing up to die to die, to shed his blood, to become the sacrifice once and for all for our sins. But his plan was not to stay in the ground, but it was to overcome death and the grave and to rise again and overcome death. Our righteousness with God is by faith alone in Christ Jesus. You see, I, I said fear is, fear is a form of faith. And I just asked this question today, where is your faith? Have you put your faith in God? is your faith in him. Fear is faith placed in the wrong thing. Where do we place our faith today? Don't be afraid. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, self-discipline, a sound mind. Would you bow your heads with me? What is God asking you to do? Don't be afraid. Are you afraid of what other people think? Let's be concerned about what God thinks. Are you afraid of where you stand with God? You don't have to be afraid about that. Put your faith in him. Trust him. This morning, I want to just invite you to put your trust and your faith in him. Whatever fear that you face, whatever struggle it is, today is an opportunity for us to put our trust and our faith in God. Father, I pray that today that you would speak to our hearts, draw us near to you. God, dispel those things that bring us fear. Because you're saying throughout scripture over and over, do not fear. I'm with you. Jesus, you came to earth. Emmanuel, God with us. Because you love us. You care for us. And you want to be with us. We trust you, God, that you're working things together for good in our life. And we put our faith in you today, fresh and new. I want to invite you to stand, and here's how I want to close this morning, is I want to just close in a time of prayer. If you'll stand with me, whatever you have need of this morning, maybe it's something of fear that you're facing. Maybe you just need a healing. Maybe you need a touch from the Lord. You need wisdom, direction. You need relational help, whatever it is today. God is here, and he will meet you. Here's what the enemy will do. He'll put fear in your, in your mind and in your heart saying, don't go do that because then everybody's going to be talking about you. The enemy uses fear in all kinds of ways. But God has given us power through Jesus, not fear. I want to encourage you today just to draw near to him, draw close to him. If you have a need this morning, I want to invite you to come. And if you uh, feel led to pray, I want you to come and pray with them. We want to fill the altar with people. I, I believe that there's no reason why we leave this room today with our struggles, with our troubles, and with our worries. Let's just leave them here and trust God that he has got a plan. And that no matter what he is saying, no matter what he's asking us to do, he's going to follow through. 
Amen. So while we sing this song, if you just come, find a place here to pray. If you need prayer, someone will come and, and join in prayer with you this morning. Let's ask God and believe God for, for great things today.